today I will be talking, uh, my talk is titled, The Law of Sowing and Reaping. And I would just like to say a short word of prayer before we start. Can we do that? Just bow down your head. Lord, it's always a pleasure to be in your presence. And I just uh, want to bring every one of us in this room into your heart, into your uh, presence, oh God. And just ask that indeed you would just speak to our hearts. I pray that I will just be nothing but a vessel through which you will communicate that which is in your heart to your people. Everyone under the sound of my voice today or who will have the opportunity to listen to this word later on, I pray that you would pick of it, O oh God, and just sow a seed in their heart that will bear the kind of fruits that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so um, the law of sowing and reaping, you know, I'm going to say what I'll be talking about today, I think is something that it's not new to, to any one of us, but I just want to remind us, put us in remembrance of some of these things. You know, it's important that we say these things every now and then so that we can put them to use. Um, now, talking about sowing and reaping, um, I grew up in uh, the compound where we used to live, where I grew up in, we stayed about 20 years in this place. Um, there used to be a very big garden. We had a big garden in this compound back in Nigeria. And my dad, who was a lover of farming, would, uh, of course, took advantage of it. It was his exercise routine, you know. And, of course, he had to pull me along and the rest of my, my siblings. And we... You know, in this garden, we would plant yams. You know, for those of us who don't know what yams are, it looks like that. <laughs> looks like that. So it's a staple food in West Africa. And it looks like sweet potato, you know, but just that it's bigger. And uh, so we would dig ridge, ridges and we plant these yams. And, of course, the land was very fertile. We didn't need to use fertilizers. And this thing would just grow, you know, and we have big tubers of yams coming out, you know. And uh, the only problem was that this was really organic farming, you know, so there was no chemicals or whatever. Uh, but the problem was that there were weeds, you know. The weeds were always contained with the plants, and we had to weed and weed, and it took about seven months or thereabout for these yams to mature. So this was a lot of work. And the beautiful thing was that... Oh, yeah, the beautiful thing was that after a period of seven months or thereabout, like I said, we did not reap sweet potatoes or carrots or onions, which were things that all grew under the ground. You know, this thing grows under the ground. We reaped, we harvested yams, you know. Actually, that's not surprising, right? It's not surprising. It's, it's what we would expect. So, uh, I, I, to put it in perspective, I like the way that uh, one preacher put it. He says that you reap what you sow. You harvest what you sow. Number two, you harvest more than you sow. And number three, you harvest later than you sow. That is, you don't harvest immediately. It's hardly the case. I mean, it's never the case that you harvest immediately. So these three things are prime. And these principle is what is normally referred to as the principle of sowing and reaping. Interestingly, I like to say that this principle does not only apply to sowing plant seeds. You know, we sowed yam seeds and we reaped yam at the end of the day. Uh, after a period of time, and, and we didn't just actually reap the seeds of yam, you know, that we, re we, we planted. We reaped tubers, big tubers of yams, and also we had to contend with uh, the stem of the plant. It was part of what was harvested, even though we didn't consume it. So, this principle does not only apply to sowing plant seeds, it applies to almost every facet of life, whether, and it applies to Christians and non-Christians, it applies to every of man's endeavor, 
our actions and our inactions. By that I mean the things that we do, our deeds, and the things that we do not do, consciously or unconsciously, they are all seeds. They are all seeds. And what happens is that every of these produces a harvest after some time. It doesn't matter whether you, it doesn't really matter whether you believe it, whether you accept it or not. It is just a principle. It is like the law of gravity. It's just there. It does not respect you. It does not care about what you think. If you throw something up, it's going to come down, except it's going to be pulled down by the force of gravity, except there is another force that is preventing that thing from coming down. So generally speaking, it just, it's just there. Now, the problem is that many times we do not recognize when it comes to the issues of life, the connection between sowing and reaping. It's not always as straightforward as putting a piece of yam on the ground or maize on the ground. And of course, it's not, when it comes to the issues of life, it's usually a little bit more complex than that. And so it is easy for us to lose sight of the connection. But even though we lose sight of the connection, it is still there. It is still there. We are prone usually to attribute, you know, the harvest that comes afterwards to probably something else. We are prone to do that because maybe it takes place several years after and then we lose sight of the connection or just, we just forget that there was a root cause, you know, of the problem. Or in some cases, we just choose to live in denial. You know, we don't want to connect the sowing to the harvest, you know. And this is just like we will see shortly living in folly, living in stupidity. And this isn't God's desire for us. Now, one reason why people are unable to connect sowing to reaping, Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. It says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Usually when it comes to evil deeds, because of the time span that exists between the sowing of that deed and the consequence that comes afterwards because of the time span, um, people just feel that nothing is going to happen, that it is meaningless. In fact, I like the way the message translation puts this verse. It says, because sentence against evil deeds, it's so long in coming, people in general think, people in general think they can get by with murder. In other words, people just feel that they can live as they like. Because there are no consequences, you know, or because they cannot con- connect the consequences. But this is definitely not God, what God, this is definitely not what God wants us to do. Paul reminds us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. He says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. That is, don't be deceived. Don't deceive yourself. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always, always harvest what you plant. You will always harvest what you plant. And when it comes to deeds, when it comes to actions, when it comes to inactions, that is the things that we refuse to do, there are consequences. And he goes on to say, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful sinful nature will harvest decay, not only that, they will harvest deaths from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So he puts it into perspective here and says that our deeds produces a certain kind of harvest, two kinds of harvest, depending on what we're doing, depending on the nature of this action or inaction. It will either produce decay and that's or it will produce, you know, uh, everlasting life from the Spirit. So, 
Paul is saying this because it is actually very easy for us to just lose sight and deceive ourselves or just lose consciousness of the fact that nothing, you know, that we do just evaporates and nothing that we do. So, if we live in such a way that we only gratify the desires of our flesh, the desires of our human nature, there will be consequences in this life. There will be decay. And the decay may not come in the way that you expect it to be, but there will be decay. That's what Scripture says. So, to make us, to bring this a little bit more into perspective, I like to look at the life of um, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was the one who, who betrayed um, Jesus. And we know one of the problems is that many times people go on sowing the wrong kinds of seed because it's usually very small. They consider that it is very small and insignificant things. They look very insignificant. Maybe nobody knows about it. Pastor Dan does not know about it. Your family members may not know about it. You know, the people that really love you who will be able to correct you will not know about it. And so because of that, um, we just like, it doesn't really matter. You know, you become consumed by the spirit of what, the, the spirit that back in the day we used to call the it doesn't matter spirit. You know, but really, does it? not matter at the end of the day. We need to understand that whatever seed our deeds, whether they are small, whether they are done in public, whether they are done in private, they have the potential to produce harvest. And this is what we will see uh, shortly in the life of Judas Iscariot. Remember that this guy had the privilege of sitting down with Jesus on the same table. He was called just like any of the other disciples. And he had direct access to Jesus. He listened to all the teachings of Jesus. But the problem was that he had one small craving. He had one small issue. uh, One small, it was a small bad character. And in scripture we'll find in John chapter 12 verse 6, the Bible just drops a line there. John, Apostle John who wrote this scripture just dropped a line. He says, he, Judas Iscariot, was a thief. And having a charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put inside. Now, this guy was an important guy. If you belong to an organization and the treasurer, the guy who holds the purse, is one of the most important people in that group, right? So, Judas Iscariot definitely either had skill with money, or they, they, they recognized that he could handle this. But there was a small problem. The Bible said he was a thief. And remember, this guy was not, um, you know, taking a gun and robbing the German Central ba- Bank. He wasn't robbing the bank or stopping the bullion van or going to the shop. You know, and with a gun like you will see in movies or sometimes in, the, uh, in some places. And, you know, just, just take a thousand or a lot of money. He was not. He was just like, I don't think there was a lot of money in Jesus' spots, you know. There were just 12 guys. There wasn't a lot of money. He took every now and then. It was kind of small. I believe it wasn't so big. So um, the other disciples either did not notice or because it was so small, they just ignored it. But it was a problem. It was a problem. He took a little every now and then. That's what the scripture, that's what the scripture says. But the problem was that he was sowing a seed. Very soon, as we will see, <laughs> very soon there were consequences. Number one consequence was that he reaped more than he sowed. He reaped what he sowed. He reaped what he sowed. That's the first consequence. And what did he sow? He sowed seeds of greed. It was a little bit of love of money. It was okay. I mean, he he, he definitely had needs that he wanted to meet. And these needs, I believe, must have been genuine needs. And uh, the only problem was that he satisfied those needs through the wrong means. Yeah. They were genuine needs. So I believe. I mean, that's why he wanted to take the money. But there was a problem. There was a problem. He, he reaped something. 
he reaped death at the end of the day. There is every indication in Scripture that Judas Iscariot ended not in heaven, but in hell. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 8 that we just read, it says those who live only to satisfy their sinful nature will have this decay and death from that sinful nature. So what did he sow? He sowed, you know, uh, seeds that gratified his sinful nature and the end of the day he reaped death. Not good. Not good. So the fact that he had probably had very genuine needs and that he needed to meet uh, did not exempt him from reaping the harvest that was due to him. So the question that I have for you at this point is, what kinds of seeds are you sowing? What kinds of seeds are you sowing? Are you sowing seeds of greed? Little love of money, not too much, just to satisfy really genuine needs like Judas Iscariot. Are you living a life that satisfies or gratifies your sexual desires? It's okay, those sexual desires are placed there by God, but they, he, he put boundaries within which they can be satisfied. If you're satisfying these outside these boundaries, you are actually gratifying the flesh. This is just a simple definition of gratifying the flesh. Are you sowing seeds that um, encourage other sexual vices like, you know, investing your time in porn? That's a seed. Nobody knows about it. It's in the secret of your room. But it's a seed. Just maybe every now and then, not too often. But it is a seed. It is a seed. And harvest will come. Is it unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is a, har- is a seed. It could be hate. It could be drunkenness. You know, it could be cheating. Selfishness. Little white lies. Just little white lies. You know, just to save yourself every now and then. But this is a seed also. Or maybe seemingly um, harmful things like complete prayerlessness. For Christians. Don't spend time with God. It doesn't matter. Only when we come to church on Sunday. It's kind of like harmless, but it is a seed. It is a seed. Or just keeping bad company. You know that you shouldn't be associated with the wrong kind of people, but, well, you know, they don't influence me, but it's a seed. It is a seed. It is a, there are many kinds of seeds that we sow, you know, or just being idle in church. You know that the Lord has gifted you with certain things and you should be serving the Lord in whatever way that he wants you to serve him. And you are not doing this. Brothers and sisters, that also is a seed. Remember I said that it is not just the actions, but the inactions are also seeds. So the question, like I said, what are you sowing? What kind of seed are you sowing? Number two, Judas ripped more than he sowed. He ripped more than he sowed. Definitely, we cannot deny the fact that he reaped some level of satisfaction from picking from the purse. That's why he went back every now and then. And like I said earlier, he probably had genuine needs. You know, he probably had genuine needs. Things, maybe family members or whatever, he needed to solve some little problems here and there. And so there was... That was a kind of harvest. So he harvested a little bit of satisfaction from, from that also. I think scripture also supports that in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 17. Scripture says, stolen bread tastes sweet. <laughs> stolen bread. When you take something that does not belong to you, at the moment it tastes sweet. When you do something, you know, that you are not supposed to do if you gratify your sensual desires, we cannot deny. We are adults. There is pleasure in it. So there is some level of satisfaction. So he, that was one of the things that he reaped. And, um, and that was the reason he sowed. And he reaped a little bit of that. But there is a problem. That's not where the scripture ends. It says, but soon your mouth is full of gravel. Meaning that <laughs> you will reap more than you sow. You will not only reap sweetness, but later on you are going to have a mouth that looks like it is full of gravel. Keys, you know what gravel is. That's not fun to have in your mouth. In other words, you will get more than you sow. And what are some of the things that we know that uh, Judas reaped? He became partly responsible for Jesus' death. Because at the time, the seeds, the greed, 
began to grow and grow and grow, and the money from the post wasn't enough anymore, so he, wanted, he went for the kill, you know, for the big, the big, the big one. And he sold his master for 30 pieces of silver. I think it is a lot of money because it was enough money to buy a piece of land in Jerusalem. If you go to Berlin and you want to buy a piece of land in Berlin, it's not going to be cheap, right? It's going to be a lot of money. So 30 doesn't sound like a big figure, but I think that in Jerusalem, at the time this happened, that would have been a huge sum of money. He went for the kill, and he probably thought that like Jesus did the other times where Jesus would just walk away from the crowd and nothing would happen to him, that it would happen, but he did not this time. He also reaped a full package of guilt because he, be, he felt when he noticed that Jesus was going to be killed and Jesus was sentenced to death, he became so full of guilt and he went, there was more. That was not, he became so full of guilt. He wasn't happy, he condemned himself. He didn't ask for forgiveness. He went ahead and he took his own life. He reaped untimely death. That was not his time to die. And ultimately, like I said earlier, he reaped eternal condemnation. Judas definitely reaped more than he sowed. He reaped more than he sowed. So I guess at the beginning, he, when he was picking all these little, little things, he never really thought that this thing would go full-blown. That was never his intention. But that did not stop the consequences from coming uh, to pass. Imagine the hurt that he would have cost his family, his friends, and even the rest of the disciples, their heart. It was a full package. It was full-blown. So, I have another question for you at this point. Do you realize that there are huge consequences for your actions or inactions, whether they are big or whether they are small? There are huge consequences. I said earlier that None of your Christian friends, if you're a Christian, may know about it. Um, a pastor may not know about it. He's not like Prophet Elijah. He should get some more, you know, prophetic anointing so that he can see our hearts. It's not like that, so he probably will not know, you know. But there will be consequences. Third thing, he reaped later than he sowed. He did the consequences that he faced did not come immediately after, you know, picking money from the post the first time, the second time, the third time, or however many times he picked it. He, he got some level of satisfaction, you know, um, gratification from, from doing this. But the full package of harvest only came later on, several months after, probably several years after he started picking from the post. So it is important for us to keep in mind that even though, um, you know, if, if, if Judas was alive, he probably would not have connected the uh, little acts of picking from the post with what happened eventually. He probably would not. But let us not make that mistake. Let us not make that mistake because there is a time lag of between sowing and reaping. Make no mistake about it. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all, must emphasize, we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or for the evil we have done in this earthly body. Must. It's not a matter of choice. It is a must. Second scripture, Ecclesiastes 12.14, God will it is not an optional statement. He will surely bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or bad. He will bring it into judgment. He will bring it into judgment. So keep that in mind. I don't want to scare us, but I just want to put out there what the Scripture says. And it's important that we do remind ourselves of these truths every now and then. Now, most of these passages um, do uh, point to like our eternal destiny. The scriptures that I just read points to the consequences that 
associated with our eternal destiny, you know. Even in Galatians that I read, you know, what will come up at the end of the day. But we need to realize that even here on planet Earth, the physical world, many times the circumstance, the consequences of the things that we do wrong, also uh, we, we suffer them sometimes. We suffer them. It's not always postponed to eternity. Just last week, Pastor Dan preached here about the life of David, right? King David, great man, but he had some flaws. He taught us about how his failure as a father, specifically his indifference, his indifference, his inaction to the bad behavior of his kids eventually resulted in a lot of calamity in his family. There was agony, there was murder, there was rape, there was war, and there was death. It was, he sowed seeds of inaction. He could have corrected his kids. It was not only the guy who this kind of thing happens for, happened to. Reminds me of Eli, the priest, who also did not play his role as a father. He was indifferent. And the consequences was not necessarily eternal. Scriptures record them. So how many um, problems, how many, how many difficulties, how many on, you know, pleasant experiences have we had because of uh, not taking seriously the kind of seed that we are sowing. On a very light note, I remember a story a preacher told once uh, about a young lady who grew up in a Christian home. And his uh, mom, dad, Christians, they brought her up in a Christian way. But of course, she grew up and wanted to do her own thing. Yeah? This does not have bubbles like Pastor Dance Water. I don't take, I don't, I, I, I'm always asking myself, why would someone drink water with gas inside? If I want CO2, I drink Coke. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, talking about this lady, she, you know, but she, she, she was sowing the wrong seeds, you know, meeting up with the wrong crowd and didn't want to serve the Lord faithfully even though she knew what to do. But in her heart, she really wanted to marry a Christian, you know, good Christian, because she could see uh, parents. You know, I like the way they, I like, the, you know, I would like to marry a Christian like my dad. And one of those days, she went out and was in a party and met this young, handsome young man. And um, they, they talked, and it turns out that this guy was a very good Christian, shared his faith. And she got to find out that this guy was a really, really good Christian. And because they had a very good conversation, she was excited. I, this is the man, you know. And she was hoping that this guy would ask her out for a date. So she went to her mom and told her mom that, Mom, it looks like I found a guy. You know, this guy is great. You know what, Mom? He's just, he, he's just like you and dad. He's a great Christian man, and he loves the Lord. And I think he's going to, he's going to marry me. And the mom looked at her her and said, darling, if that boy is who you describe him to be, truly, he will not marry someone like you. He will not marry someone like you. If that guy is what you are saying he is, he will not marry someone like you. You cannot reap what you do not sow, people of God. So this is a clarion call. Uh, for us to take seriously the kind of seeds that we sowed. And to make it a little bit more practical, I want to tell us three things how we can achieve this. Practical steps to ensure a good harvest. The first one there is stop the deceit and repent. Stop deceiving yourself. Or I should stop deceiving myself too. You know, this is not just for you, it's also for me. It's easy to stand here and say all these things, but I'm also confronted with the same truth. So stop the deceit. Let's all stop the deceit and let's repent. All forms of wrongdoing, all deeds or non-deeds, whether in public or secret, they are seeds 
They may be small actions. They may be big actions. They are all seeds, and they will produce and harvest. That's why Paul reminds us, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You cannot mock the justice of God. God is not like the judges in the courtrooms in Germany, who you can persuade if you can pay a very good lawyer. Yeah? He cannot be persuaded because he's the judge of all. You will always harvest what you plant. You will always harvest what you plant. But there is hope. The Bible says that people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. For me, this is just fantastic. This is just fantastic. That there is an opportunity available to every one of us to change the course of justice. To change, you know, at least the eternal consequence of our, uh, of, of, of our sins or what we do wrong. Um, Jesus has paid the ultimate price, people of God. Jesus has paid the ultimate price for our sins. And so we can be exempted from the ultimate consequence for, of sin. That is separation from God, death in hell, when we confess and we turn from our sins. So there is a lot of hope. And we can rejoice. You know, added to this, I like to say that, you know, in many cases, God also delivers us partially or fully from even the earthly consequences of our sins. In other times, in other cases, he may allow us to suffer those consequences because he uses them. They become tools in his hands to make us Better reflections of Jesus, just like one of the songs that we sang here today. Powerful song, by the way. I love it. I think the second to last song we sang here. You know. So, why would you throw such an opportunity away? Why would you so throw such an opportunity away? Christians who acknowledge, our, who acknowledge their wrongs and turn to God's forgiveness do not get what they deserve. Amen. People of God who turn to God and ask for forgiveness do not get what they deserve. Do, they do not have to reap what they sow. At least eternally, they do not have to. And this is actually because of the sacrifice of Christ, because of what Jesus has done. And this is definitely in stark contrast to the law of karma, which is um, a, a Buddhist or Hindu doctrine. You know, that's, which states that you get what you deserve. Your number of good have to outnumber your number of evil. You know, if not, when you come back in the next life, you may be a tortoise. But thank God, when we stand before God, our sins washed, nailed to the cross, triumphed over, we would not have to face or reap what we sow. What a privilege. Number two, stop sowing to your sinful desires. Start sowing to the Spirit. Stop sowing to, stop sowing those seeds. If you don't sow them, they will not produce a harvest. It is not enough for us to acknowledge and to confess. We must also take practical steps to overcome those sinful desires. Yeah, we need to take steps, steps that will starve you know, those wrong desires. This may require you breaking off from some friends. It's painful experience. It may be painful choices that we have to make. It may require you breaking off from some friends. It may even require you changing jobs. These are the practical steps that we can take. It may require you, watch this one, to cancel your Netflix subscription. It may mean for those of us who struggle with our, the lust of the eyes. It may mean banning yourself from going to the beach because you will see pictures and things that will begin to play in your mind. It may mean not listening to certain kind of music. It may mean confessing your thoughts to your fellow brother or sister and asking for their prayer support. These are practical steps. You know, these are all Steps that amount to sowing to the spirit. And, yeah, it may mean joining a home cell group. 
where, other, where you can be accountable to other Christians. People of God, as the saying goes, if you keep doing what you have always done, you will keep being who you have always been. I want to say that again. If you keep doing what you have always done, you will keep being who you have always been. Pronto. So we must change direction. And changing direction can start by taking simple practical steps, some of which I have mentioned today. The third one, do not grow tired of doing the right things. Do not grow tired of doing the right things. Now, most of the things I've mostly spoken today about the wrong seeds. But I know that there are people in this room, many of us, I believe, who also sow good seeds. Who also sow good seeds. The problem, or one little problem with sowing good seeds is that just like uh, sowing bad seeds, the consequence, the reward doesn't, you know, also comes not immediately. So it is easy to get discouraged. It is easy to get discouraged. And Paul addresses this group of people in Galatians chapter 6 verse 8. Those who live to please the Spirit will harvest eternal life. Everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At the right time, we will reap the harvest of blessings if we do not give up. So are you sowing good seeds? There is a reward waiting for you, if not in this lifetime, in the world to come. Jesus, somewhere I think in the book of uh, Luke, if I'm not mistaken now, told his disciples that say, those of you who follow me in this world, you would... Be blessed. And you will also be blessed in the world to come. And there are a lot of blessings. There are a lot of things that God delivers us from. Just because a lot of stress that we are free from. Just because we follow Christ. Just because we follow Christ. So there's a reward for living a life that is pleasing to God. Especially in relation to small matters. I really want to emphasize that. You know. Small matters, not only the big one. In small matters, just serving the Lord in those small matters. Pleasing the Lord in those small matters. Those small acts of unrighteousness that you think go unnoticed, they do not. Don't get weary of doing them. Nobody may be there patting your back and telling you, great job. But there is a reward. Jesus notices every of them. And there's one scripture that really brings that close to heart. He say, and everyone... Who gives one of these little ones? Matthew 10, 42. And everyone who gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water. <laughs> because he is a disciple. Truly, I say to you, truly, he will by no means lose his reward. Giving a cup of water to another Christian. That is the simplest thing ever. Right? That is the most inconsequential thing ever. A cup of water? Who blesses someone for giving a cup of water? Especially when the person is not like really dying of taste. But Jesus notices that. How much more? How much more? Those little sacrifices that we make for him. You know? Those costly sacrifices that we make for him. Like walking backstage and nobody knowing that you are there. Like saying no. To sing, even though Pastor Dan is not there, or your wife is not there, or your husband is not there. Say no to sing, even when no one is watching. We cannot afford to give up. The price that awaits us at the end of the day is huge. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what the Lord has prepared for those who love the Lord. I hope that we will be encouraged today to keep up with our good deeds and where we involve ourselves in sowing wrong seeds, we confess to the Lord, we turn around and we take practical steps. We take practical steps to follow the Lord. Let us pray. Father, it is easier said than done. We confess to you our inabilities and our weaknesses. 
I confess to you our weaknesses, Father. For everyone who have heard, was convicted in any way, let this not just be an opportunity to smack ourselves, but let what we have heard today produce fruits unto repentance. Give grace and power and help us to sow the right seeds today, tomorrow, and all the days of our lives. Amen. Let's love.